Hi, my name is Laura Weidinger, and together with Maribeth, I'm excited to present to you the paper titled Taxonomy of Risks Posed by Large Language Models. So let me give a quick intro to language modeling for those who are less familiar. Here at the top of the slide, you can see a sequence of uh, images of a horse rider. And the better you can understand the patterns and structures underlying the beginning of the sequence, the better you would be at predicting the last image of that sequence. And language modeling works similarly. So language modeling is a form of sequence modeling. And the way it works is that some input is given, for example, the starting of a sentence like language modeling is, and then language models output the likelihood of different words or tokens completing that sentence. For example, the word difficult, fun, or easy. And the way language models do this is that they are trained on large amounts of data on natural language, and from that, try to learn the structures and patterns that give rise to the kind of sequence that is natural language. And so based on the sequences that they've learned in their training data, they can then make these kinds of predictions. And over the last few years, thanks to an increase in the data and compute that is available, especially to some institutions, we've seen a real increase in the size and capability of these kinds of models. So much so that they can now generate natural language that seems really human-like and which lets us imagine a range of potential new applications. For example, creating more useful language assistants or using language models in science to generate new insights by uh, synthesizing or distilling information from large amounts of data. Or creating new creativity tools, new entertainment methods, and even integrating language with other modalities, such as robotics. But language models also create uh, great risks of ethical and social harm, and that's the focus of our paper here. So here you can see the uh, overview of the taxonomy that we create in this paper. So we make two contributions. First, our goal is to create as comprehensive an overview as possible of the different types of risks that might arise. And we identify a total of 21 risks that we analyze in detail. And second, we're trying to structure this really complex and broad risk landscape that emerges that language models create into a way that is more easily passed and that is more useful for, um, for conversation between practitioners and so on. And we derive these six thematic risk categories that you see here. And our goal in this work is really threefold. So first, as I just mentioned, we're, we're, we're trying to help and support mitigation work by practitioners to address some of the risks of harm we've identified. Second, we're hoping to help inform public discourse on large language models and, the and raise awareness of the kinds of risks that may come, but also of the mitigations that exist. And third, we're really trying to feed into the organizations developing language models and into their decision-making processes to help responsible innovation and responsible decision-making. The way we generated the taxonomy was through a mixed methods approach. So firstly, we hosted some horizon scanning workshops between interdisciplinary researchers at DeepMind. And uh, the goal here was really to identify two types of risks. So surfacing risks that practitioners see already when working with large language models, but also anticipating risks that we can kind of foresee already based on what we know about these models and their strengths and weaknesses. And we complemented the insights from these workshops with uh, looking at very extensively at a, a kind of broad literature review. And primarily we drew heavily on fact literature, for example, the Stochastic Parrots paper that was presented last year and other literature that is surveying the kinds of risks that might arise and looking into methods of assessing and measuring those. But we also scoped uh, more broadly looking at uh, political briefings, civil society literature, and other academic literature like NLP benchmarking or um, gender studies, for example. And so from all of this broad scanning, we derived the taxonomy of risks that we're presenting in the paper. So here's our taxonomy one more time, and I'll now walk you through the risks one by one. So let's start with discrimination, hate speech, and exclusion. 
And uh, to give you a warning that in, if you want to avoid seeing uh, harmful stereotypes being reproduced and a reference to violence, skip just that next slide. I won't read out the example that uh, ca could cause offense. So discrimination, hate speech, and exclusion harms describe the kinds of challenges that stem from the model reproducing real world language that is in the training data. So this output may reproduce social stereotypes that you see in the training data, or it could pr uh, promote exclusionary norms. For example, assuming that someone called Alex is always male. Information hazards, our second risk area, include risks from the model providing output that is sensitive and true. For example, leaking private data. Contrast this with misinformation harms. They come from the risk providing of the. Uh, they come from the model providing false, misleading, or poor quality information. For example, picture a language model giving bad legal advice or bad medical advice. Malicious use refers to the kinds of risks that can arise from people trying to use the model to cause harm. So someone getting hold of the model and using it, for example, to write scams or frauds or to help with coding coding malware. Human computer interaction harms, I'll go into that one in a bit more detail as well, arise from when a person interacts directly with a language model or with a conversational agent built on top of a language model. So the kinds of challenges that emerge here are really rooted in the fact that language models can produce such human-like language and natural seeming interactions as a result. And in a way, you could imagine that technology can be interacted with in a more human-like way than was previously possible. And this could lead to the humans uh, interacting with the models to be made vulnerable or misled or deceived in some ways through this interaction. For example, if a person speaks with a conversational assistant and that assistant uh, implies some kind of personhood by refer referring to its own personal history, preferences, and so on, this could lead to the human interacting to overly trust the assistant give away more private information than they otherwise would, or rely on it in domains where this is actually not safe. Our sixth risk area is about ways in which language models can impact broader social and environmental systems, and are likely to disproportionately benefit and harm different groups. For example, it's been widely noted that training and operating language models requires a lot of energy, which in turn can cause environmental and social strain. Social risks include job automation or task automation, for example, in the creative industry, as language models can be used for, say, screenwriting. And in this category, we also introduce risks from groups lacking access to the model and language models performing better in some languages, for example, than in others. So the open challenges that we close the paper with are threefold. Firstly, of course, we've identified this whole range of risks of harm that requires mitigation. And a lot of work is already ongoing. One challenge here is to make sure we keep stress testing the mitigations that we have and to keep a broad look of the different kinds of risks that might arise. And then the second is around normative decisions that we're actually having to make. For example, setting thresholds of when is a model safe enough or when is a model uh, good enough. And for that, we require some fair and, and inclusionary pipelines. And finally, we need to expand the analysis toolkit, by which we mean really broadening the view of the kind of methods we have to assess the levels of risk of harm that we have. And that's what Mary Beth is going to talk about in a bit more detail now. Thanks, Laura. So I'll be talking about some next steps that we have identified building off of this work. In particular, our work has led us to focus on the importance of evaluation as a next step. So our work surveys a broad landscape of harms, and ultimately, we want to mitigate these harms in the real world. But a prerequisite of mitigation is evaluation, because evaluation is what enables us to observe the harm in practice and then develop an appropriate mitigation. And then again, once we've mitigated the harm, we have to evaluate again in order to see if the mitigation has, in fact, been effective. And so we see that these two our evaluation is both a prerequisite of mitigation and something that must happen continually alongside it. So our work uh, identifies or indicates that there are major challenges for the field within evaluation because there's a large space of harms to cover. Our work identifies six risk areas within which there are 21 observed and anticipated risks. And not only that, but many harms are emergent 
and will only um, become clear as language models are deployed more widely. So socio-technical analysis in this large and evolving space calls for a lot of future work. For example, we identify in the paper risks arising from human language model interaction. And here we're seeing a harm that's more unique in the language model setting. These models can be used in highly interactive ways, such as in chatbots, and these interactions can be very compelling and even human-like. And this presents a risk of harm that we're only beginning to understand. And to do that, we need to evaluate an evaluation that goes beyond a lot of the typical benchmarking. Um, and we think new evaluations should draw on fields with relevant insights, such as that of human-computer interaction, or HCI in particular. So this evaluation of harms arising from human language model interaction illustrates a broader point. We believe that evaluation requires a toolbox of interdisciplinary tools so that, um, and many of these are being worked on in the fact community, such as auditing, governance, um, user experience, research. And we also have seen that evaluation needs to be approached from multiple angles and coordination across these angles. Um, because mitigating for one issue can in turn exacerbate another. For example, we've seen work in which mitigating for toxicity can exacerbate bias. So to conclude, our work introduces a taxonomy that offers a structured landscape of both observed and emerging language model risks. And these six areas can help guide public discourse as well as work on evaluation and mitigation of these harms. And with that, thank you for listening.